Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives. Our guest today is Dr. Bernard Fennell, who is a Senior Associate and Director of uh, Terrorism, Counterterrorism Research at the American Security Project in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Dr. Fennell, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about your work, uh, and maybe you could start with the American Security Project itself. I know there's a very interesting bipartisan group of individuals involved with it. Uh, wh what's, what's the reasoning behind it? What do you hope to accomplish? Well, our concern is at the American Security Project that American foreign policy has become much too politicized, much too bro broken up by partisan rancor. Uh, there used to be a, a notion that politics uh, ended at water's edge. That's no longer the case. And it's not good for the United States. It's uh, not helpful for our foreign policy. It makes it difficult for us to make commitments abroad to other countries. Um, it makes it difficult for us to implement our foreign policy in a sort of consistent, long-term fashion. And so our goal is to try to find a way to recreate uh, that foreign policy consensus, that consensus that really helped us build the institutions that won the Cold War, right? And when you look at, at the early post -cold, the old, early uh, Cold War period, we see a lot of bipartisan uh, working together. Truman with Senator Vandenberg, um, and really that's what we think we need now in this uh, new complex world that we face. So our job has been to try to do two things. Um, one is to try to bring some senior leaders together, uh, people who have a year's experience, uh, people like Senator Kerry, uh, f a former Senator Hart, Senator Warren Rudman, Senator Gary uh, uh, Chuck Hagel, as well as a, a whole series of senior military officers, bring them together and say, are there some principles that we can all agree on as Americans, as people who work on foreign policy our entire lives? And the answer is yes. There's a whole bunch of principles. Now, they may not be shared by everyone in the foreign policy community, but they're shared pretty widely, and it's possible to imagine a bipartisan foreign policy being built on principles like respecting our allies and working closely with them, um, using force when we need to, but not necessarily as a first uh, resort, uh, and not necessarily as a last resort either, but as the right resort. Um, using all of our instruments of statecraft, blending our, uh, our, uh, our, our, all our power sources, diplomatic, informational, economic, as well as military power. And you can actually sort of walk through that um, on issue by issue and find that there is some pretty decent consensus. So our job is to build that consensus and then to take it outside of the beltway because too often we end up just in the beltway talking to each other. And one of the ways that the average person can access your information is through your website if you'd like to share that uh, with our viewers today, that would sure. be useful. It's at www.americansecurityproject.org. Okay. And will that have some of the most recent reports on issues such as uh, where we are in the war against terrorism, which we'll be talking about today? It does. It has all of our reports, including our, report, our annual reports on progress in the war on terror, as well as a document we call the New American Arsenal, which sort of lays out these broad principles I was just talking about. We have some documents talking about budgets and how you'd actually fund this kind of foreign policy, as well as issue papers on a variety of, 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 of breaking and pressing issues. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit more about this need for a bipartisan foreign policy before we get specifically into the terrorism, counterterrorism area. And why, in your mind, do you think it went away? Why did we stop working in a manner that, as you said, was so successful to our efforts during the Cold War? Well, I think it's a function of a couple of big things, and I think we've never fully recovered from the Vietnam War. Uh, the Vietnam War really sort of tore apart the American foreign policy community as well as the country. And in some ways, we're still paying for the legacy of that. Uh, but beyond that, I think that the, it's been an issue of, of political leaders who've seen the hate be made from um, exacerbating our divides, from um, you know trying to label one party or the other as weak. And usually, it's been conservatives trying to label liberals as weak and liberals trying to label conservatives as warmongers. And that's not helpful. Um, it may win you an election. It may help uh, you know, define your message in a positive or negative way, but it's not really something that brings the country together along a long-term strategy. So I think it's a combination of having never really recovered from the, uh, the trauma of Vietnam, as well as, as political leaders who are just focused on getting elected as opposed to focusing on governing. And uh, that's something we have to break out of the cycle of. What about in the, in the current presidential campaign? I, I get a lot of correspondence from people all over the country who say to me, you know, we'd like to have a bipartisan approach to foreign policy. We'd like to see real discussion between the leading candidates on these foreign policy issues. We recently had 
the first of the presidential debates. It was supposed to be primarily about foreign policy. It, it was in part, but after the, the debate, uh, again, I heard from a lot of people who were not satisfied. In fact, one of them said to me repeatedly, um, you know, just like that old commercial we used to watch, where's the beef? And well, where is the beef? And, and how do we approach that again in, in bringing them back to a bipartisan discussion? Yeah, and the problem is there are some legitimate areas of, of difference, and we can get that in a second. But you're right, you know, if you actually look at what Senator McCain and Senator Obama were saying, there's a lot of overlap in substance. You know, this whole debate over where we negotiate with the Iranians, it turns out that whole thing is about whether the president directly negotiates with Ahmadinejad or whether the Secretary of State negotiates. I mean, it's, that's a tiny little piece of it. Everybody agrees on need for direct negotiation at rel uh, relatively high levels. Um, so if that's going to be the differences, then really, you know, we can be sort of uh, positive in, in the sense that there are a lot more commonalities th than we're seeing. It's still sad, though, that they spend all their time harping on the differences. But I guess you have to do that in a political campaign. That said, there, there are some areas where there are, I think, more larger and more legitimate differences. Um, there are real interesting questions about who are America's allies in the world. Um, you know, in many ways, people like John McCain have a, a notion that, well, the allies who, who brought us are the ones that we have to stay um, loyal to. Uh, the Europeans, our democratic states, and countries that weren't uh, closely working with us back in the Cold War either, we should still be skeptical of uh, countries like the, in, in, uh, people like the Indians, uh, the Chinese, and others. And I think that there's something significant there because um, what Obama's arguing instead really is the need to focus on a much more multilateral policy which is going to try to bring in these new actors in, in fundamental ways. And so that there's, there's a real difference there about which allies you can rely upon um, and how you can define your foreign policy in relation to these uh, new powerful countries, some which may have been adversaries in the past, some which um, uh, may not be as helpful as we want them to be now, but in the future, I think you're going to you're gonna have to work with the Indians and the Chinese, for example, and even the Russians. We can't just think, uh, try to marginalize them or, or put them aside. So I think there's some differences there. There's differences about how often you use force, and do you use it um, very early in the process, do you use it late in the process, how much you can trust uh, adversaries, and those are all legitimate policy disputes, and I think you don't have to have consensus in the sense of everybody agreeing on everything, but we can have a consensus to have a civil debate um, and say, look, I mean, just because we disagree over um, prioritizing uh, 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 Georgian independence versus uh, non-proliferation efforts in Iran, that's a legitimate policy debate, and we don't have to question each other's patriotism in the course of doing so. Well, I, I wanted to go back to what you were talking about. You said, you know, maybe it's the nature of the election where you're supposed to disagree, but can't we have both? And I'm thinking specifically about a program that your institution organized recently featuring two former national security advisors, Brent Scowcroft and, and Zbigniew Brzezinski in a discussion moderated by David Ignatius of the Washington Post. And the three of them have collaborated to produce a, a, a book called America and the World. And what I thought was remarkable about the discussion was y you had two senior, respected statesmen who came from different political backgrounds, had served uh, administrations of uh, different political stripes, and yet they were engaged in a civil discussion. They agreed to disagree at times, but when they disagreed, it wasn't this sort of in, in your face, uh, you know, attempt to embarrass the other person. It was sort of a gentlemanly uh, expression, and then they proceeded to the next point. And oftentimes, they did have the same end goal. And so what they did was move the discussion forward at each stage in a way that I thought was, was very constructive and very refreshing. And I don't see why it's so difficult to have that sort of thing happening now, especially in terms of the debates where you should be really trying to find out where the candidates stand, uh, not for them to be talking about history, to be talking about uh, things in circles. You know, if, if, if you're asked, you know, what is your position on, you know, the economy and, and, and the bailout? What is your position on the U.S. relationship with Iran? Why not a specific answer, one that, that and, and even if there's too much there, you to get your hands around, as, w as is the case with the bailout, you could at least say, well, it's a complicated issue, but here are three things I like about it, and here are three things that cause me to have some concerns. That gives 
the, the viewer something to work with. That would be some of the beef that they're looking right, for. Right, right. But how, how do we get to there? Well, you know, I mean, here's the problem. I mean, people say, if you ask them, do you like negative ads? They say, no, we don't like negative ads. But when you look at the impact of negative ads, they work. And so this is another one of those cases where people may say they want the beef, but ultimately, you know, the, the political consultants have done the polling, they've done the focus groups, and they're probably finding that people don't necessarily want the beef, really, that they would get bored of it uh, with, with intricate policy details, and what they're looking for someone to convey a sense of strength or a sense of change. Um, and that's, that's, that's how they're, they're trying to define their campaigns. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do that. I mean, part of the role of a politician, strikes me, isn't just to win, but perhaps to educate, um, to explain why um, the policies that he or she favors are the ones that the country ought to follow. Because here's the, the rub. We're, we're running campaigns where, in the end of the day, you win, but you can't govern um, because you haven't built any consensus um, or, around your policies. And you know, think about, about uh, President Bush's attempt to reform Social Security. He really didn't mention it during the, his reelection campaign. Then he wins. He says, OK, I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to turn my attention to. Well, people said, well, we hadn't really voted for you on that basis. You hadn't sold us on this issue. And so you, we're not going to follow you. The same thing on foreign policy grounds. If you don't uh, step forward and actually try to convince people and sell your, your arguments while you're running, it's going to be very hard to implement them later on. But then this, by the same token, people push back and say, but if you do that, then you're not going to win because your guy's going to just uh, try to kick you in the teeth um, by parsing your words. And so there's that issue. Another issue, though, is there's a legitimate concern about overcommitting yourself um, in, a, in a debate format. You know, diplomacy is sort of fluid, and you don't know what's going to come, and you want to maintain your leverage. And I think there's too much concern with that. But nonetheless, that is a legitimate concern as well to say, um, why well, I want to lock myself in for my administration on the basis of something I say in a debate, which really shouldn't be a, a policymaking uh, situation. But let me add one more point about Brzezinski and Scowcroft. They're able to have a civil dialogue in part because their positions have moved pretty close together ultimately. That both people come from a, a tradition of an, a realist kind of approach to foreign policy where power matters, uh, where idealism is really sort of secondary at, at most, um, where restraint is crucially important. Uh, prudence is a, is a watchword for both of these men. And so they come to the table with a huge amount of, of issues together. And even though one's a Democrat and one's a Republican, as a practical matter, um, you know, there, there's a, a great deal of, of, um, of similarity in their, in, their, in their views. Unlike, for example, we look at sort of the new uh, Republican perspective, the neocon perspective on one hand, and the liberal interventionist perspective from, the, from uh, the Democratic side, those are quite different perspectives, different approaches, different sets of values. And the, the, the reality of this is I think there is more tension and more divides in current policy debates than there were perhaps um, between people like Brzezinski and, and, uh, and Scowcroft. I mean, at the time, if we take instead of, of Scowcroft, another person like Richard Pearl, who worked in, in the Reagan administration, and on, instead of, of taking um, Brzezinski, you took Cyrus Vance. So if you took Cyrus Vance and, 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 uh, and Pearl and put them in a room, you might not get quite as civil a dialogue as you got between those two gentlemen. Well, maybe some of the work falls to us in the period between presidential campaigns to take pairs like uh, Brzezinski and Scowcroft and have them talk, and, and not just the two of them, but I'm guessing you could put together teams of mm -hmm. Democrats and, and Republicans who are reasonable and, and who have this common area of interest, and they could be sent out all over the country and, and really engage the nation in substantive debates and show that we can move in this direction. Right, right. If people are going to be interested, and you know, the problem is that one reason why it's so important to behave in a responsible fashion during the campaigns, in my view, is that's when you get the attention of the, of the public. 57 million people tune in to watch the presidential debates. Um, that's a huge uh, turnout. Otherwise, you know, when people aren't focused on it, you're competing with Survivor and Dancing the Stars and, uh, and The Office and all the other kinds of things that, that, that distract people's attention. So I'm not sure that how much of a, it, it's a, it's work. I mean, you have to do it. I think it's important to do it. But I do think that there is a, a, a particular iron is hot kind of, of, of uh, a moment in presidential campaigns to try to engage the public. Well, let's talk a little bit specifically about some of the reports that have come out and what you're trying to do in part is to offer guidance to the new administration. Whichever party wins, uh, these are challenges that, that, that they would face. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that you've recently issued a report in is the area of where we are in the war against terrorism. Right. And 
maybe just summarize the, the main finding of the report and then we can get into some of the other aspects. The big picture main finding is that um, we're not doing as well as we probably ought to be. Now that's a hard, that's a hard statement to back up because you know, the question is, well, how would we be doing absent our current policies? And you don't know that. So it's hard to figure out what the baseline of expectations is in terms of how bad the threat would be if we'd done something different or if we'd done nothing. But nevertheless, you know, we are now in a situation where there are more attacks by Islamist terror groups around the world than any time um, that our data shows. So if you go back 10, 15 years, um, we have more attacks around the world now uh, by a factor of 10. So it's not just a, a small increase. We're at the highest levels now. There seems to be so, a little bit of leveling off in the past six months to a year. It's hard to get a real sense until you've had a couple of years of data under, under your belt. But nonetheless, very high levels of attacks, and it's all over the world. It's in pl it's places from Russia to um, to North Africa to Southeast Asia to Europe. So there's there's challenges all over all over the world as far as that goes. And our concern is that we're not making sufficient progress, and that we're not really focused uh, in, in appropriate fashion in terms of our strategy. Well, if, if we were to embrace a different strategy or improve our, our current one, what, what would be some of the steps you would recommend based on this, this new report? Well, you know, he, here's the paradox. Uh, the Bush administration has been very successful in terms of its counterterrorism strategy, um, but the strategy hasn't had the impact that would be expected it to have. Right? They thought that the initial problem with terrorism was state sponsorship. It was countries like uh, Iraq and Iran and the Taliban who were sponsoring terrorism. And they've been very successful at reducing the amount of state sponsorship, in fact, removing some terrorist sponsor regimes, uh, Iraq in particular, certainly the Taliban regime as well. So that worked. They, they had this notion that um, the United States was perceived as weak in the Muslim world and that therefore we had to demonstrate strength. So that's what they've been doing in Iraq for the past five years, showing how tough we are, that we will fight for our interests. And that's come across, the message has come across, and yet the attacks are at the highest level. And the reason is that as a practical matter, the problem wasn't about states. Uh, states, in fact, were using the, ter the, the terrorist movements, the Islamist movements, or trying to deflect them, but they weren't constructing them. They weren't building these movements out of, out of whole cloth. Instead, they were trying to channel this aggression, which was lodged in their societies, in, in, in ways that were less dangerous to them or more productive to them, depending on, on the country. So, kind of Saudi Arabia, for example, has this, this, this uh, real Islamist movement from the country, and they just wanted to make sure that it wasn't targeted on the Saudi regime. Um, fair enough. But that was not the same thing as saying they were sponsoring terrorism or creating the movement in the first place. The second part of it is that many people in the Muslim world don't see us as weak. They see us as strong. They see us as too strong, as omnipresent and omnipotent. And that, in some ways, that's the big problem that we face, is that even people who think that al-Qaeda is a, a horrible organization that kills civilians, there's a sort of grudging respect for, for al-Qaeda and bin Laden, not because they're terrorists, but despite the fact that terrorists, because they stand up to the United States, in some ways our narrative over the past eight years has just, seven years, has just fed into that um, dialogue that goes on. So I think that really, from my perspective, uh, the way forward is, is a couple of ways. One, you have to find a way to, to get the senior leaders who attacked you. It's just a, it's a terrible image for bin Laden and Swahiri to be able to send out these videos on a regular basis touting that they're still alive, uh, calling for more attacks in the United States. It makes us look weak on one hand, but also gives um, a lot of confidence to, to people in the Muslim world who might want to attack us. And uh, worse than anything else, every time we engage in any action which isn't targeted on these guys, it feeds into conspiracy theories. You see, the Americans really aren't about killing bin Laden or getting rid of al-Qaeda. They're about expanding their power in the Muslim world or in the Arab world. And so we have to, to those have to be the first steps we take. We have to find a way to constrain um, bin Laden and Swahiri, and that's hard. But h how do you do that? And what, in your opinion, is the reason we have not been able to get bin Laden? Is it because it's impossible, or uh, does it perhaps serve our interests to have him out there, you know, continuing to feed, fuel the fire? I don't think it serves our interests. I think we just haven't taken, we, we've been thinking about this war on terror in one month, two months, six months increments as opposed to a decade long increments. We keep talking about this being the long war, but we haven't taken any steps to institutionalize it. And I'll give you an example. The, uh, the Northwest Provinces and the Fatah in, in, in Pakistan, ungoverned spaces, in fact, increasingly formally ungoverned, right, where, where the Pakistani government's signing uh, agreements to make these areas even more ungoverned, give them re even more local autonomy. Well, you know, that's a problem. Um, you can't have a part of the world where a country says, well, no, we're sovereign, and you cannot take action in this part of the world. Oh, and by the way, we're not really act actually governing it. 
But that's a long-term process to, to address that. You have to create some sort of a new international law about ungoverned spaces and about terrorist groups operating from ungoverned spaces to create a framework whereby you can actually go to Pakistan and say, look, you people are not living up to your obligations. Uh, you, in fact, have an, an international legal obligation to do something, and we have an international legal right to respond if you don't. Build a consensus around that, get the international community supporting it, and then it's not just bilateral. It's not just the United States that's going to Pakistan saying, do we say or else. It's the entire international community in Pakistan saying, you guys aren't living up to your obligations. But that's a multi-year process. That's international law. It means going to the UN. It means uh, having uh, conventions and so on. So that's one thing we can do that would be quite different. The other thing is we have to um, get rid of this, this, this notion that we just need to keep demonstrating strength in, in, the, in the Arab world. Instead, I think we need to think about uh, reducing both our fingerprints on policy and our footprint on the ground. We have too many forces um, uh, scattered throughout the, the Middle East, and we're too involved in too many policy decisions at this point. So as, as you look to the future uh, in, in terms of the new administration and its um, opportunity to, to deal with these security threats, do you feel that we have a chance to be well positioned, or do you feel there's going to be this period of time where because there has been another administration in place for two terms and you've got somebody, again, no matter which one it is, very much different mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in some respects uh, from the current administration, what, what, what do you think is likely to happen? I think that it's, it's a crucial transition point because here's an opportunity to say, look, the policy of the last eight years are not necessarily reflective of American foreign policy in general. This was the, the, policy, the policy of the Bush administration. If you continue them for another term, then at that point, it, people are just going to start saying, look, that's just the way America is. So I think that there is this opportunity if we do make a pretty radical transition, um, be more respectful, more restrained um, throughout the Arab and Muslim world, that we do have a chance to change our image as far as that goes. But it's going to be a long-term uh, challenge as well, because the, these issues like Pakistan's ungoverned spaces aren't going to resolve themselves no matter what the new administration does in the short run. So we have to do two things. Is one, we have to highlight the differences and be more respectful in the short run, but in the longer run, be more active in building the institutions that will, in fact, help us combat this threat. Do you see an opportunity to have real bipartisan advisors in, in the next administration, where you actually have members of the other party coming in and serving in cabinet positions? I think that'd be great, but I can't imagine that happening. OK. So it's, it's something that would be nice. Um, how do you think the American people are prepared to deal with this ongoing war against terrorism? Do you feel that they've been lulled into a sense of false safety because we haven't had uh, attacks since 9-11, at least here? Or do you think they have learned from that experience and, and really do understand the evolving terrorist threat? Well, what's interesting is that if you look at the polling data, it seems that uh, the American public is much less concerned about terrorism than it was just a few years ago. And there's two ways to look at that. One way to say well, they've been lulled, that they're not uh, paying attention to the threats that's still out there, and is still out there. On the other hand, you know, people who were, yet for years, people were saying that they thought there was going to be likely a, a terrorist attack on American soil in the next few weeks. 40%, um, 50% of the population believing that. And that was never really likely. You know, we had one attack in 83. We disrupted some attacks around 2000. There was an attack in 2001. But this is, America is a hard target. We don't have an indigenous, um, effective jihadist community in the United States. Um, and just as a general rule, striking at American targets is not easy for these organizations. It's, it's a reach for them. So having a more realistic assessment of, of the threat, I think, is, is, is healthy. By the same token, we need to, you know, we, I think we, we need to talk to the American public about this being a longer term struggle and what the implications are for the country. And the implications have to be more than take off your shoes when you take flying a plane and keep shopping uh, to make sure that you show your confidence in the American economy. There has to be sort of a sense that this is a long term struggle. We don't have to deal with it every single day, but we have to be aware there are going to be some sacrifices that are going to be called, that we're going to be called upon to make at various times. And, um, but not panic about it either, not use it as a political cudgel. It's a hard line to balance. And I think a lot of times when an organization or a report criticizes the existing policy, there's a tendency on the part of some to come back and say, well, it must not be really a severe problem. And I don't think in any way your report suggests that the terrorism issue is not a serious problem. No, we think it's very serious. And, but, it, but it needs to be handled differently. But it needs to be put in, in the context of, of realistic threats. I mean, it's, it's serious. 
But, you know, I mean, the year after 9, in, in, in uh, 2001, 10 times more people died on the roads in highway accidents than died in, um, in the attacks of 9-11. Of, of that's not to minimize it, but that's just a fact. And we need to be aware and balance off the risks in some sort of a, a rational fashion and not become too um, overwhelmed by them. But nonetheless, you know, what's interesting is, is, is a political um, response. We've said for two years in a row now that we're not really quite winning the war on terror. We're not making great progress. Well, last year, most of our criticism came from liberals who came out and said, you guys are overhyping the terror threat and you're just playing into the hands of the, the administration. This year, for whatever reason, all our criticism has been from the right, saying, oh, you guys are, are underestimating the impact of the Iraq war, and you know, it turns out we really are winning the war on terror. I, I, you know, I don't know what's changed from one year to the next. Our data looks about the same, but somehow our critics have, have, have turned around 180 degrees. That's politics for you. Now, your latest report was issued uh, on the anniversary or about the anniversary uh, September of September 10th. September 10th, okay. And maybe just for the benefit of our audience, could you mention some of the other issue areas you're researching that you'll be producing papers on in the near future? We're also doing a, 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 a broader project on American defense policy and talking about the creation of a national security budget as opposed to just a defense budget. One of the problems we have in our country is that we uh, probably overspend on defense, at least relative to what we spend on for the State Department, for U.S. Uh, information operations uh, abroad, uh, trade promotion, all sorts of other kinds of things. There's a lot of things that we could be doing to engage the world in a more productive fashion. Instead, we're spending really very heavily on defense and trying to really bring that into balance. And that's just really in line with what Secretary Gates, uh, Defense Secretary Gates, has been arguing as well. So there's got to be a way to rebalance our, our defense budget. So that's one thing that we're working on uh, quite extensively. And then we're going to see what, what the issues are to come up for the next administration as well. We do rapid response as well on, as, as challenges arise. Good. Well, thank you, Dr. Fennell, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.